afternoon. I'd like to talk to you about walking with God or being a part of a great falling away. And I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It reads, Now uh, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Paul had visited the Thessalonica, and in Acts 17 it shows that there was a great deal of persecution was stirred up to the point that they sent Paul away because he was the chief speaker. Silas and Timothy were left behind as Paul went to Athens to start a new work there. But the persecution continued to grow and increase. So about a year later, Paul sent his first letter, 1 Thessalonians, to the people to correct some erroneous thinking that they had. Because of the intense persecution they experienced, they felt that they had missed the rapture and were in the middle of the tribulation period. So Paul lays out some dispensational events that would occur first. The second epistle was also to correct these further thoughts of missing the coming of the Lord. And it sets the stage for our text. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and are gathering together unto him. These are two subjects Paul is discussing with the Thessalonians, and because God's word is eternal, and we too are waiting for the coming of the Lord, it refers to us as well. The subjects are, number one, the coming of the Lord, and two, are gathering together unto him. In his first epistle, in chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, Paul described how this was going to happen. For those who believe that Jesus died and rose again, or those that are born again, God will bring with him. And it always refers in Scripture to those who have believed in Jesus and have died as not being dead, but as being asleep. Verse 13, but I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. When a beloved brother passes away, we grieve and we mourn, but not like those who have no hope. We know that we shall see them again, and these are to be words of comfort to us. In verse 18. Then Paul goes on to say in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Again, he uses the term sleep, and God will bring them with him. Why? Well, to start with, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, 2 Corinthians of chapter 5, verses 6 to 8, When a Christian breathed his last, his soul and spirit go back to God that gave it, but his body goes into the ground. When an unsaved person dies, his body also goes into the ground, but his soul and spirit go into hell and is tormented in flames, as the story of the rich men and Lazarus indicates in Luke chapter 16. But as to the reason why God brings back the souls and the spirits of those who have gone uh, to heaven is that God is not done with their bodies yet. In Job 19, verse 25 and 26, it declares, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at that latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Job realized and recognized that though his body would be consumed by worms and rot and decay, that he would stand and with his own eyes see his Redeemer in that last day. 
Paul describes what will happen at the Lord's return in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 53. He declares that we shall be changed. This mortal will put on immortality, and this corruption shall put on incorruption. It will happen in a moment of time, in the twinkling of an eye. That uh, one quick sound and we are changed and we are out of here. The dead bodies in Christ will be raised, raised first and be joined with their spirits and the souls in the air. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Both the resurrection and the dead and the transformation of the living will be an anatomic of time. It will almost seem instantaneously. Uh, it will happen so quickly. Unsaved people talking to those that are saved will suddenly uh, see clothes fall to the ground, eyeglasses and hearing aids fall to the ground, teeth, fillings, and dentures fall to the ground, uh, hard valves and stents and pins and broken bodies and replaced knees and hips falling to the ground as their body is uh, restored and made whole and incorruptible and immortal as it joins with the Lord in the air. They will see unmanned cars uh, careening down the streets and unpiloted planes miss the airfield. There will be confusion and pandemonium everywhere. Some homes will be without a dad, some without a mother, others without children. Some homes, no one will be gone, everyone will be there. You know, all babies and very young children will disappear from off the earth uh, instantaneously. Some churches will be empty, while others will even be more crowded than ever before as unsaved pastors uh, try to explain to their congregation what has happened. And if you want about to talk about a change taking place, this is the ultimate change of changes. At the coming of the Lord, we will be gathered together unto him. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, Paul gives four warnings. He says, don't be shaken in mind. Don't be troubled in spirit. Don't be upset by the words of others. Don't be uh, shaken or troubled by others' letters. Being shaken in mind and troubled in spirit are two different things. The word shaken in mind means to be agitated like stormy winds that create giant waves in the sea. Jesus spoke to these waves at many different times and he brought peace with just his word. And he can do the same with troubled waves that are in our lives. He needs to only speak to them. Peace be still and there is a tremendous calming effect. The message of Jesus is coming is to be one of comfort. 1 Thessalonians 4, 18 to those that are saved. The word troubled is an outcry, but the literal rendering of the passage reads, nor to be disturbed, neither through a spirit. Don't let deceiving spirits trouble you. There is going to be, and even now is, deceptive spirits that are at work concerning your faith and mine. Lying spirits and spirits of deceit are trying to undermine our faith continually. They are working. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.1 that in the last days there would be seducing spirits. Later on in our text, verse 10 and 11, the Antichrist himself will be a strong delusion. And because men would rather believe a lie than the truth, God will send them strong delusion that they might believe a lie or literally the lie or the Antichrist. God will allow that to happen because people want to be deceived. They want to believe a lie rather than the truth. And I am amazed at how many, and even Christians, are, have embraced a spirit of antichrist that is present in our present world, is prevalent in our present world. For Daniel describes the antichrist coming as one who will change times and laws. Daniel 7.25 the times that we are living in are changing so fast, and laws are being changed. What laws would Daniel be talking about? Godly laws, godly laws that sanctify marriage, sanctify life. The spirit of Antichrist is pro-homosexual, wants to bring down the destruction of marriages and families and babies, uh, the pillars of our society, wants to bring those to an end. And to embrace these things is to embrace the spirit of Antichrist. You know, just um, now uh, this is uh, confusing to some. In Second Thessalonians 2, 3, it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. What day is he talking about? The day of the coming of the Lord and the gathering of the saints. 
The rapture and the second coming are not the same event. They are divided by seven years of time. The rapture are when Christians are resurrected, what we described in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 51 to 53, uh, is when Jesus comes first and we are gathered with him in the air. The second coming of Jesus is when he comes down to earth. His first appearance is when we meet him in the air. His second coming is when he comes to earth. Paul is talking about the rapture, not the second coming. This refers to you and I meeting Jesus, we who are saved. The passage deals with the coming of Christ and our gathering together unto him in verse 1. Now verse 3, again, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Before the man of sin, the son of perdition, the antichrist, the beast, the lawless one, for he is known by many names, be revealed, there will come a falling away first. There are two ways to look at this falling away. Number one, the falling away is our falling away from this present world and being gathered together unto him. And let me give you some verses very quickly here that describes that event that will take place. In 1 Thessalonians 1.10, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. I only want to point out that God is delivering us from the wrath to come, not through the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. We, the bride of Christ, are to obtain salvation, not be appointed to a time of God's wrath. We may experience man's wrath, while we're here in persecution, but we, the bride of Christ, will never be subject to God's wrath. He loves us. He has redeemed us with his own blood. We are his forevermore. He is going to present us faultlessly to his Father with exceeding joy. Jesus foretells the signs of his coming in Luke 21. And Jesus' last words to us in that chapter in verse 36 are, Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that you may be accounted worthy to escape all of these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. God's intent is not that we are to escape some of these things that are to come, or even most of these things to come, but that we might escape all of these things to come. And we shall all appear before the Son of Man. Romans 14.10, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. As Jesus speaks to his church in Revelation 3.10, which deals with the things that are and the things which, that are in our present age, he says, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Again, he will keep us from this time of temptation, not through it, and, uh, but from it. John was shown the things that were, the things that are, and the things that are to come, Revelation 1.19. The things that were was the exaltation of Jesus Christ in all his glory in uh, times past. The things that are are the present church age, which you and I are dwelling in right now. The things that are to come is when our present age ends and it starts with the rapture of the church. John in Revelation 4.1 writes, After this, after what? After this present church age. After this I looked and behold a door was opened in heaven and the first voice I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me which said, Come up hither and I will show thee the things which must be hereafter. After this verse we do not see the church on earth again but in heaven. It isn't on earth until we come back with Jesus in Revelation chapter 19, 19 where we step on earth again. 
John, from this point on, he shows us things that will be hereafter. And the time starts when the trumpet, uh, the voice of a trumpet says, come up hither. Going back to 1 Thessalonians 4.16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise. This is what starts the time clock of the tribulation period, and it is down to the day. 1260 days, 42 months, three and a half years, time, times, and a dividing, a time, half a week, uh, many places in Scripture that the Antichrist then breaks his covenant with Israel and the two witnesses are killed. This ends the first half of the tribulation period and then starts the great tribulation. Now returning to 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, except there come a falling away first. The second way to look at this is that there is a great falling away from the faith. The term falling away is the Greek word apostasy, where we get the English word apostasy. It is a defection and a revolt from the faith. So which of the two are true? Will a great many fall away from this present world in the rapture? Will many fall away from the faith? I believe both are true. But the language here is that let no man deceive you pertains more to the latter, to be vigilant, to be sober, to be walking closely with the Lord. So you're not a part of those that are deceived and left behind. At the Last Supper, Jesus said he would be betrayed by one of his disciples. And one by one, they began to ask him, Is it I? Is it I? Is it I? Today, if Jesus was to have this event, we'd be saying, is it him? Is it her? Is it him? You know, we need to be asking, is it I? Will I be one that falls away from the faith? Now, I'd like you to turn with me to Mark chapter 4, and let's look at verses 14 to 20. And we're still talking about the falling away. As Jesus shares four kinds of hearts in this passage, only one of these hearts will leave this world when Jesus returns. The other three will be left behind. In Mark 4, verses 14 to 20, Jesus is explaining a parable of the sower. And Jesus speaks about four kinds of hearts, a hard heart, a shallow heart, a crowded heart, and a fruitful heart. And this may be offensive to one who believes once saved, always saved. But salvation is more than a one-time prayer affair. Is it possible that one could lose his or her salvation? Is it possible that the elect could be deceived? I feel we need to let Scripture interpret itself. If we walk with the Lord, it doesn't matter which theology that you believe in. Whether you believe you can lose your salvation or not, if you're walking with the Lord, it doesn't matter. It only comes into place if you're not walking with the Lord. Where do you stand? And there's a huge difference between the two outcomes. So we need to take a look seriously at what the Scripture says. The first is a hard heart. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this as much as with the next two, because this heart never received Christ in the first place. It had the opportunity... The seed was cast toward it. It was not uh, a matter uh, of the seed. The seed was good. They heard the gospel message that was sown into his or her life. Mark 4.15 declares, And these are they which are by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Now, I, I do want us to note that Satan came immediately. As soon as the seed was sown, as soon as the word came to them, as soon as they had opportunity to hear, as soon as they had an opportunity to have their lives changed, uh, a life-changing experience come into their lives, he came and took that away. Why did this happen? It was hard ground. 
Uh, the seed never penetrated the ground. The, the ground was beaten down and it was hardened uh, after time and time again. And life can be that way. It can be a hardening experience. It can be very discouraging. It can make us very skeptical of anything and everything. We've been deceived. We think we know it all. Spiritual things don't pertain to me. They pertain uh, to others. And we decide to make a choice. I can live without it. I can live without him. I can live without it all. Seducing spirits do their work. Emissa emissaries of Satan, they whisper in the ear, they're only after your money. They're weak. They're fools. They're caught up uh, with all kind of things. And don't be caught up with this bunch. And so Christ and Christians are slandered and put down. They are mocked and made fun of. And such are the voices of the world that is inspired from beneath rather than from above. And they are ignorantly, uh, willingly ignorant of who Christ is. If they had known who he was, they would have never crucified uh, the Savior. These demonic spirits will say, take the high road of enlightenment, of education, of great understanding. Be wise. But as Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 7, that in the last days they will be forever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. With all of their study and with all their education, with everything that they are learning, they never come to the knowledge of truth. As a result, the emissaries of Satan come and steal the word away. We may never feel conviction again because we ignored or turned away from perhaps the only chance that we would ever have to hear the gospel and to respond to it. Scripture says in Isaiah, call upon me while I am near. The implication is that God is not always near. We think that we can come to him when we want to, but it is his calling and we come to him on his terms and his calling. And sometimes he does not call. September 2nd, 1971, 41 years ago, I received Christ as my Savior. And in all that time, I have never had anyone try to tell me about Jesus. They have never offered me the opportunity to receive Christ as a Savior. I believe that was my one chance, my one time to receive Christ. And I did, and I responded to that call. The second heart is a shallow heart. Mark 4, 16 and 17 reads, And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness, and have not root in themselves, and so endure for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. This heart doesn't have much depth to it, but nonetheless receives the word and receives it with gladness. They are excited about their walk with Jesus. They are glad that they have received Christ. Uh, they love coming to church, singing the songs, and even some like giving of their tithes and their offerings and uh, giving of themselves to a certain degree. But they can't be involved with service just yet, uh, maybe later. They can't be committed to a time of prayer. Uh, uh, or even to the reading of the word, let alone memorize it or study it uh, or meditate on it. They love the blessings. They're addicted to the good feelings that come with being around God's people. They want to be fed, ministered to, cuddled, and provided for. But forget about correction. They move from church to church, and they find fault with one congregation after another. They find fault with one pastor after another. It's their fault, and they're like tumbling weeds uh, that you could never build a church upon. This is to the opposite spirit that dwelt in our Lord, uh, who came to minister, not to be ministered unto. He came to serve and took on himself the form of a servant. He came to give, not to receive. He came to pour out of himself, not to be poured into. Many who call themselves disciples walked with Jesus for a while, but when he said things that offended them, it declares in Mark 6, 29, Jesus said, You seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat the loaves and were filled. They followed him for fish sandwiches. They followed him just for the blessings. And then when Jesus began to speak of things that were offensive, that they found hard to receive, it says in verse 66, it says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. So what happens to a person to make them fall away, to apostatize, to turn back and to walk with him no more? 
Never in their wildest dreams had did they ever think that they would be leaving Jesus. Did they leave their first love like the church of Ephesus? Were they offended like those in John 6? Peter swore up and down that he would never deny the Lord. None of the apostles ever thought that they would flee and leave Jesus standing alone, but they all did. In Mark 4, 17, it says, when affliction or persecution rises. And notice it says when, not if. For persecution will rise to each and every one of us who follow uh, Jesus. We're, we're not exempt from it. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers out of every one. Mark goes on to say that they were immediately offended. They didn't have to think about it. They didn't have to roll it over in their mind. It wasn't a matter of things building up to the point, I can't take it anymore. No, it says immediately they were offended. Why? They had no root. They had no root. There was no depth to their life. You can live that way for a while. These did. Uh, they received the word immediately. They received it with joy. They began to grow. The seed germinated, pushed through the ground, sprouted leaves, and was shooting up. They started fine. You can guide, glide along, you know, just for a time. You can slide for a season. You can take it easy for a while. But there will come a time when you will be tried, either by God or man. God will allow you to experience the purifying fires, the refining fires. He will prune the branches and cut you back a bit because he is a loving father. He will chastise his children from time to time. And man will not hesitate to see what you're made of. Uh, Jesus told us in John, John 16, 33, In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Uh, I have overcome the world. Those who have no depth didn't stick around to see the delivering power of God because in their life they were offended immediately. They never last long enough to see God answering those 12 o'clock prayers, those prayers when you are pushed and backed and backed again to the wall where you wonder where God is, but still you cry out to him and you see God come in and answer and deliver and provide and meet all of those needs. They never saw that because immediately they were offended and they left there because there wasn't any depth. Uh, so they never saw themselves. They never allowed themselves to be tested, to be tried, to be pruned, to be chastised. They wouldn't receive it. So immediately they leave. The third heart that Jesus talks about is a crowded heart. Mark 4, 18 and 19. And these are they which were sown among thorns, such as heard the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. All three hearts, the hard heart, the shallow heart, and the crowded heart, all heard the word of God. The shallow heart and the crowded heart both received the word and began to grow, but both apostated. Both of them fell away. Both died in their sin. Where the shallow heart had no depth, and you could understand the trouble they ran into, there was no one to blame but themselves. They didn't get into the word. They didn't get into prayer. They didn't get into service with others. And perhaps their commitment was a, a token commitment or a shallow commitment at, at most. But the crowded heart falls away much more subtly than that. You see, there's no problem with them receiving the word, unlike the hard heart. They have plenty of depth, unlike the shallow heart. But this heart may have been following the Lord and enjoying his blessings for some time. They have, may have studied and read and memorized and meditated on the word of God, actually put these biblical principles into practice and to work, and in turn, God blessed them. And again, the words if and when, God never says if you are blessed, but when you are blessed. And there was a reason that God told Israel six times, when I bless you, and again, not if. But when I bless you, do not forget me. And the tendency is that we do forget. Jesus mentions the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things that crowd out the heart and choke it. 
Jesus spoke more about money and man's relationship with it than he spoke about heaven or hell. Three out of every five parables deals with man's relationship with money. It's the litmus test of our spirituality. It reflects where our priorities are, and more important, where our heart is, for where our treasure is, there our heart is also. Some feel God blesses them so they can increase their standard of living rather than doing something for the kingdom of God. But isn't that a novel idea? That God blesses me so that I can bless the kingdom. To live with that aspect instead of God blesses me so that I can enjoy it all. I'll pull my barns down and build biggers and uh, that I can have it all. They feel an entitlement to covet what God has given them because it's a blessing from God. But the problems with these kind of things when they come in and blessings and accumulation is fear. The fear that we will lose the blessings that come in. We worry about our job ending. We worry about retirement accounts being stolen by companies or politicians. We worry about our 401ks becoming 201ks, whether the stock is going up or falling. We worry about thieves and corporators stealing what we have heaped up treasures for in the last days. We worry about inflation rusting or, rusting or eroding it away because we forget who our source is, who's provided it in the first place. It's easy to develop an idea that somehow it belongs to me. After all, I have the title right here in my hand. Here's the deed to the ranch. It belongs to me. And we developed this idea, but everything has been entrusted to us. We are owners of nothing but stewards of everything. And that's all that we are, are stewards. And God lends us stuff for a time and a season. Now, gold and silver are intrinsic. The only value they have is the value that we put on them. Silver could care less whether we think gold's more expensive than it. Money doesn't have a soul. Stocks will never love you back. You know, just even the land that you think that you might own, you pay rent on it in the form of taxes. And if you don't believe me, what's what happens when you don't take your taxes, pay your taxes? The sheriff is going to come and confiscate everything you have, whether you have a title or a deed or not. You know, it's all temporary. Everything that we have here is temporary. So how can riches be deceitful if they're intrinsic? Well, it's the sin within that affects the sin without. It's what's in the heart that deceives us within that allows the riches that are uh, without to deceive us. It's always a matter of the heart. And it doesn't just have to be the deceitfulness of riches. Jesus said other things crowd the heart too. Jesus said other things enter and choke uh, the word right out of us. TV, entertainment, hobbies, movies, books, magazines, the internet. None of these things are necessarily wrong in themselves. We should do all things with moderation. Sometimes people choose bad relationships rather than a relationship with the Lord. They feel that I'd rather be in a bad relationship than to be lonely. And they forsake the Lord and they allow a relationship to crowd their relationship with the Lord out. And sometimes people choose habits and pleasures and other things that are sin for a season rather than a relationship with God that will last for eternity. In Luke 14, Jesus tells a parable of how many who were bade uh, to come to a great supper, they began to make excuse. I've heard the definition of an excuse as a lie wrapped in a skin of reason, but their excuses were even biblically based. Don't you like it when we have excuses that are biblical, biblically based? It makes us feel so spiritual when uh, we come to the Lord. And, uh, Jesus based this on a uh, passage in Deuteronomy 20, uh, verses 5 to 8, where they all began to make excuses for not serving in the army. Some used work as an excuse. Some used their social life. Some used materialism. And still, 
Others used fear. This was the excuse that the man who had only received one talent used. I was afraid, so I hid my talent in the dust. But ask yourself, what cuts into my prayer time? What cuts into my Bible study time or my meditation time on these things? What has been crowding the Lord out of my life? What things have come in? I can reduce all these things down to one word, busyness. It isn't necessarily that we're doing anything sinful. We're just too busy. We're too busy for God, and we're too busy for one another. And we will find out too late that the only thing that really matters are relationships that we have. These are the only things that ultimately bring us true joy, not things. These are the only things that love us back when we have relationships with God and when we have relationships one with another. And we come home at the end of the day, we're tired, we're exhausted, we fall into to bed or crash on the couch and just turn the TV on. You know, the TV, watching TV exercises the pleasure center of our brain. The creative side uh, that makes us creative and unique isn't exercise. It's almost like put to sleep as we just entertain ourselves. So we're too busy and exhausted to spend time with our spouse, time with our children, uh, let alone time with God and Bible reading or prayer. And we teach our children to do the same things that we've done. We get them involved in 101 different things and drive them from here to there and do this and do that, and we teach them to follow in our steps. In Revelation chapter 3, the church of Philadelphia had not one single indictment spoken against them by the Lord. Dispensationally, this was the church that established and built churches in this country and around the world. The church that existed dispensationally approximately from 1750 to 1900. And this church did phenomenal work, missionary work, building and establishing uh, just structures. Just, I was on a missions trip to inner city Philadelphia this last summer. And I saw a church that was built in 1865. And I was inside that, and I was looking at the structure. How in the world did they build this in 1865? How would you build it today? I mean, they didn't have cranes. They didn't have a lot of things. Everything was hand-built. And if you went up to the altar area and you looked at uh, the fine things, uh, the workmanship uh, that you could not see unless you were up close was just absolutely phenomenal. And I just looked around at this structure, and it just was... And they did this without the advantage of modern tools or electricity. You know, and this isn't a time when they went over the world. This is a time before cars and planes, electric power tools. It was a day before uh, radio, movies, the internet. It was a day before washers and dryers, before indoor plumbing and all the modern conveniences that we have. And they found time for priorities to put God first in their life to establish things. They gave generously for the spreading of the gospel throughout the world. And they gave, and they gave, and they gave. And in our culture, we just want to receive and receive and receive. Try to simplify. Downgrade. Rid your house of stuff. Empty out your garages, your attics, your storage sheds, and you'll get an idea how attached you are to things. Things you will never use again. Things that you uh, just will never get around to touching, but you have to have it, and you accumulate. And many people, they spend money every month on storage sheds, rentals, you know, to store stuff. You know, just... Uh, you know when tornadoes and floods and sea surges take everything away? It's not all bad. It's not all bad. Because a lot of times these things just take away the clutter. And we're left with the Lord. The fourth heart was a fruitful heart. They heard the word as did the other three. They received the word as did the previous two. But the one thing that separates this heart from all the other hearts, and there is only one thing that this was different than the others, is that they bore fruit. Why are you here?
why are you saved? Why did you receive Jesus Christ as your personal? Just so you can go to heaven? Well, that's partially true, for God's not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. But it's much more than that. We are called to bear fruit. If the fruit of a pear tree is other pears, and the fruit of a cherry tree is other cherries, and the fruit of an apple tree is other apples, if the fruit of sheep are other sheep, and the fruit of goats are other goats, and the fruit of cows are calves and everything, what do you think the fruit of a Christian should be? You know, a lot of times we'll say, well, love, joy, peace. No, that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. What should the Christian's fruit be? It should be other Christians. Yet we do not share Christ. 49 out of 50 professing evangelical Christians today will never lead anyone to Christ in their entire lifetime. Never lead anyone to Christ in their entire lifetime. Jesus is coming soon. Some will go, some will not. Some have shallow hearts, some have crowded hearts, some have hard hearts. You know, just uh, fruitful hearts. Fruitful hearts the Lord will take away. Now, I want to share a verse with you from John 15, 16. And I want to show you how you can be so blessed by having a fruitful heart. John 15, 16. Get it in your Bible. Write it down. Underline it. He says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. And whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Let me read it again. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bear forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. I want you to look at that. And whatsoever you shall ask in my Father's name, he shall give it to you. God will not withhold anything, any blessing from anyone who is bearing fruit. He will not withhold anything from anyone who is bearing fruit. If you are bearing forth the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost God will provide everything that you need to do that. He will bless you in every aspect and every way. Your prayers will be answered. Provision will be there. Your life will be filled with joy and peace. And you won't be left behind when he comes. In some, a verse very similar to this, in Philippians 4.19, that Christians like to quote all the time as a voice of promise. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. God meets your needs, not your greeds. There's a difference between greeds and needs. But if you look at that verse very carefully, it doesn't even talk about meeting needs. It talks about meeting need, singular. My God shall supply all your need. Well, if I only have one need, what is it? What is it? It is to be joined with him. If I have Christ, I have everything anyhow. You know, I just, uh, if I don't have Christ, it doesn't matter what other stuff I have, you know, just, uh, I'm going to be losing out. But the context of Philippians 4.19 is that Paul is telling them if they have supported missions and they have done missionary work, this is the context. If you read through the whole book, and especially this fourth chapter, then my God shall supply your need. You have supplied God's need. You have supplied God's servants. You have supplied God's missionary work. Then God says, I will supply your need. And this is what John 6, 15, 16 is saying. I ha you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and I have ordained you. And, what, and as you go forth and bring forth fruit, whatsoever you ask, I shall meet all of your needs. I will give it to you, whatever it is, whatever that you need. We need to be kingdom-minded instead of earthly-minded. We can live for a dot. This is our life, all of our life, 70 years, and uh, by strength, uh, you know, just uh, 10 more, 3 score and 10 plus 10 or whatever, and no matter how you, it all consists of just a dot. Now, a ray is a dot with a line that extends out for eternity. We can live for the dot, 
or we can live for the ray, the thing that extends forever and ever. Most are content with living for the dot. But if we are kingdom-minded, we realize everything that we have is on loan. It's just, uh, it's been entrusted to us and we are stewards. And we live for eternity rather than for time. God will bless us. And everything that we have needed, whatsoever it is, he will supply our need. Our greatest need, of course, is Christ. And if you're not living for Christ, and you've never made that decision, you need to very seriously think about it because the Lord's return is very soon. If you're a marginal Christian living on the edge, there's going to be a great falling away. If you have a crowded heart, if you have a shallowed heart, you may very likely be one of those ones that fall away. Right now you're thinking, that could never happen to me. I want you to think of Peter. I want you to think of the disciples. They were not deeply grounded as they thought they were. And when the time of temptation, the time of trial came, they immediately were out of there. But one that is deeply grounded in Christ, he will not fall away by the things that happen. Huge things, cataclysmic things can happen that will not wash him away. It's the things that happen to us gradually that take us away a little bit of time. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the little things that just eat away, that cause us to turn our thoughts from being outward and upward to inward and think about self instead of others. When you look at the Lord, he never thought about himself, not once. He always thought about others. Even at a time when he was in intense intensity and agony, that he was in the garden, he was praying for others. When he was whipped and beaten and marched on the way to the cross, he said to the women along the road, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. When they were nailing uh, nails into his hands and nailing him to the cross, he interceded. He asked, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. When they were mocking him beneath the cross, he interceded for them. He saw his mother, and he said, Behold, John, my son, he, he, don't worry. John's going to take care of you. John, this is a commission. You take care of Mary. He, just, he was thinking of everyone. He was thinking about you and not himself. And we need to take our thoughts off his self onto him and to think about everything else. Everything comes down to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Keep the relationships working. Let me just pray for you. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your great love, the example that you set. And Lord God, how you died on the cross, took away our sin and our sorrow, if we would repent and come to you. Turn away from our wicked ways, you will take our sin, and you will cast it into the sea of your forgetfulness, never to be remembered against us anymore. You put up a sign, no fishing. We're not allowed to go back for that. There is no condemnation to them that are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Lord, teach us to walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. Lord God, if we would allow the Spirit to evaluate our heart right now, if it is a shallow heart, or if it is a crowded heart. Or maybe the storms of life has uh, allowed our heart to become hard. People have tried to witness to us, and we've rejected that again and again and again. I encourage you to allow your heart to open and watch what God can do. He can turn over that fallow ground and make it a fruitful place. Surrender your heart to the Lord today. Make a deep commitment. Everything that you have, turn over to him. Your time, your treasure, your talents, surrender to him. For I've never met anyone who was sorry they gave their all to the Lord, but I've met many who are sorry they didn't. Lord God, grow us near because you have a great love. Help us to accept the times of chastisement and the pruning times. Even when we go through the refiner's fire, Lord, uh, these things shall come. But Lord God, you will see it. We will come through the waters and not be drowned. We'll come through the fires and not be burned. Lord, for you will keep and you will preserve. And there's coming a time when you will present us faultless before the Father with exceeding joy. Lord, if we but hang in there. But Lord, I pray that the fruit would remain, that no one would be lost at the coming of the Lord. Lord, that we would 
be found in that number that is caught up when Jesus comes and we hear the sound of the trumpet. Lord God, that we will experience that change and we will forever be with the Lord. Let these words be words of comfort to our minds and our hearts. Lord, let us live out a life of love that we have for you and let it be displayed not only toward God but toward our fellow man and be glorified. Draw people unto yourself. Take them deep. Take them deep in these last days. Let their anchor be passing strong that when the storms of life do come and the tribulation does come, that they will not be moved, not even one inch. Keep your people until the day of your coming, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.